chapter uh, 19, verse 30. If you take notes, I've entitled the message, Three Words That Changed the World. Three Words That Changed the World. Thus saith the Lord, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his ghost. Let's pray. Spirit of God, we come to you with this tremendous verse, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to open it up to all of us. Speak to each one here, and if there is one here today who knows not Christ as Savior, pray that today would be the day they would meet the captain of their salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to every heart, bring comfort where comfort is needed, edification where that's needed, and even conviction, Lord, if that's needed. Whatever we need, speak to our needs as it pleases you. We ask it all again in Christ's name, amen. Three words, it is finished. That's where I'm gonna park this morning. And I dare say without a doubt, no greater words have ever come from a human being's lips. Nothing anyone has ever said has had as great an impact on mankind as our Lord's last words, it is finished. Three words. And I would remind you that the lips that said it is finished are the same lips that, com that commanded in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. And instantly the world lit up. He called it into being. A universe with countless billions of stars were created with his word. So you see, it is finished are not the words that comes from the lips of an ordinary man who is about to die. Matter of fact, in another version it says, or in another uh, gospel it says, he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. A man that was tortured up all night, tortured, beaten, everything. You can imagine that was done to him, crown of thorns on his head, a robe over all the, over all the, 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 the beatings he took on his back, nailed to a cross, and, through, and hung there for three hours with our sins being transferred to him, our sin debt, and yet still he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. These are divine words that comes from the lips of God himself, incarnate. And the spiritual result of these words, it is finished, cannot be measured, it cannot be calculated, it cannot be weighed, and they can't even be totally understood. That's how powerful they are. And the reason is because these three words unlock the kingdom of heaven. And they unlock it uh, to, uh, for, to the Gentiles and for people from every nation. And Revelation uh, 118 reveals that the keys of death and hell were transferred to Jesus Christ. And every Old Testament prophecy from Genesis 3.15 to Malachi was completely fulfilled with those words, it is finished. In effect, it is finished meant that Christ effectively discharged the old dispensation and ushered in the new dispensation of grace. That's what he did with the words, it is finished. Now God's grace could go out to every nation and every people in those nations. And for the first time in history, the Gentiles would be grafted in to become and called out to be children of God. Psalm 86, 9 reveals that. All nations whom you made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and glorify your name. Which means the only reason that you and I are here today is because he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. We wouldn't be here if that didn't happen. We wouldn't be here if he wasn't God. There would be no Christianity 
We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't know each other. This building probably wouldn't be here. That's how much those words changed the world. Not to mention, if you know Christ as your Savior, how much they changed your life from where you were to where you are now in Christ. You can't measure those words. You can't weigh them. You can't even imagine them. That's how infinite they are. And the reason you're here today and you weren't before is found in Ephesians 2.12. Paul wrote, uh, told the, the, the um, Ephesians that before Christ you were separate at that time, alienated from the commonwealth of, of Israel, strangers from the covenant of province. Here it comes, having no hope and without God in the world. Before those words were, if those words weren't ushered, you wouldn't be here because God wasn't here. You have no hope. There's nothing. Every single lost soul has no hope. All you have to do is look, look online or look on television or read the paper. Anywhere you look today, you see what happens in a world that rejects Christ. They have no hope. All they do is survive every single day. Because they don't believe it is finished. But because of those words, the promises of verses 18 and 19 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, they belong to each and every one of you who know Christ as your Savior. Paul writes, For through him, that is Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer stranger and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You get that? You're members of the household of God. And, and uh, not only members of the household of God, if you go to Romans 8, 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the, the, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. You understand that? He loved you so much that he was willing to do everything he had to do that you'd be sitting here today listening to this message and even online. You'd be here listening to it. Now on a practical level, the Lord's words, it is finished, have a tremendous bearing on believers, your daily life. A tremendous bearing. To begin with, it is finished means the war is over between you and God. You're at peace with God. The wrath of God is on every lost soul. The Bible makes that, that abundantly clear. But not on believers. Because the war is over. You're no longer God's enemy. That blood that was sacrificed on that cross when he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, that blood paid your sin debt. The curse, the curse or the wrath of God has been removed from you. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. He was made your cur to be a curse for you and I. And because of that, you and I can cry out with joy. There is therefore now no condemnation to those people who are in Christ Jesus. You've been set free. That's the only way to look at it. You've been set free. You know, you may not have thought. I don't know if you do or not. I know I did. I never, when I, before I was saved, I never thought I was in bondage to anything. I was in debt, but I was never in bondage. And then after you get saved, what happens? Wow. The eyes, they open up like this and say, I didn't know. And you don't know. Because it is finished meant that now the scales of you being lost are, have been removed and you see, you see the reality of life as it is. There's two worlds. There's a spiritual world and there's a physical world. And we live in both those worlds. We do every day. You live in those worlds. The rest of the world doesn't believe that. Oh, I'm living in my world. I'm a moral person. I'm doing real good. Everything is fine. That's it. But you're only surviving day by day. That's all you're doing. Your life really has no meaning except if you die in your sin, what good did it do you to live? The Bible says, what does a man gain if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What does it mean? Zero. There's no value. But as a believer, your life, your life has value. Because everything you do has a purpose. 
And that purpose is to glorify God and bear fruit for him. And in the processes of it, you're bearing fruit for yourself. When you get to heaven, that will all be returned to you. So your life has a meaning and you understand that. And not only that, you have victory over sin. That's what you've been freed of. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and sin and the uncircumcision of your heart, God made alive together with, with him, forgiving us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. Legal demands. That is a set. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. Your sins have been forgiven. That was done 2,000 years ago, by the way. Because you were chosen before the worlds were formed. That's what it says. And the result of that is now, when he said it is finished, the blood was shed, he died, he, he paid the sin debt, your, your sin debt is forgiven. Can you imagine that? I see people get so excited. They have parties when they, when they, uh, when they uh, finally pay off a credit card. They actually have credit card parties. It's like, I just paid three grand and oh, I'm having a party, it's great. They get all excited about it. I want to tell you something. The most exciting thing in the world is to know that you and God are at peace. The most exciting thing in the world you can even think of is that your sins against him are forgiven. The most exciting thing you can think about is that now you have a path to walk on that you can understand and you can walk in the, in the center of it. Occasionally you fall off, but you're still walking in the center of it and your life has meaning. It has meaning not just to God, it has meaning to every one of us. There's not one brother or sister in this church who doesn't love the other one, would do anything for the other one. And that's because we're all on the same page. We're a Bible church, we believe God's word. And because we practice what we believe, everything is good, even when it's not. It's that simple. It is finished, made all that possible. Measure that. Measure it in your own life. We have victory over the law. The Ten Commandments, that's the law. It was on each and every one of us. Galatians 4, 4, and 5. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. God couldn't adopt you if you were still in your sin, if you were still under the law. He made you free. And i got to tell you something. If you practice your faith, You'll feel that freedom every day. I do. You should be able to feel the same freedom I do. The same it is finished applies to me, applies to you. It's just a matter of how much you believe it. It is finished also means, here's a big one, victory over death. Everybody. I remember when I was in the military, the Vietnam thing was going on. And I remember when I was in the military and I'm, and I'm going to boot camp and saying, well, you know, this could turn out pretty bad for me because I wasn't a Christian, right? And who wants to die when you're 17, right? And, um, and I thought about that a lot. And then when they gave me uh, a billet, it's called, a job in the military, uh, my job was making uh, bombs. <laughs> That's not your average job. I knew it wasn't something I could use when I got out of the military, but that's what they gave me. And every single day of my military life when I was doing my job, I thought about being vaporized. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't because the possibility was always there. Accidents do happen. Now as a Christian, a little older than 17, but as a Christian, death is nothing to me. It doesn't matter to me at all. It could happen in an instant today. It could happen right up here. It wouldn't even, as a matter of fact, it would be great if it happened up here. <laughs> but other than that, it isn't about dying for a Christian. It's about maybe you could be concerned about the method. But we have victory over death. This isn't, this isn't your life here. This is a dress rehearsal for another life. Proof first for that. 1 Corinthians 15.55 we have victory over death, Paul says, because, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your, thy victory? You die. You don't, you don't die. Nobody dies. They just leave. It's like you get on a bus, and you go, you, the bus stops. That's your death. And, a little, and quicker, than, quicker than this, you get on another bus. And that bus either goes up or it goes down. It's that simple. A or B. It's a transfer. It is finished. Means that you'll transfer up. And then your consciousness, what the people you knew here, all the, your, your faith, everything that you have here will go with you except your flesh. 
but the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That stays here, but your soul and your spirit goes to, to, to your maker, and you are, as uh, Psalm 16, uh, 1611 says, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is a dress rehearsal, and it's a bad one at that, even when it's good. When you compare it, when you compare it to what God has prepared for those that love him. Which means, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you've trusted in Christ, you're never going to die. So why should you be afraid of it? So you see, the three simple words, it is finished, unlocked heaven's front door. It opened it up. For God's chosen people from every nation and in, from every generation. Now, on a personal level, let me ask you, have you been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Is the war over between you and him? Or are you still fighting him? And everybody knows the answer. Everybody does. I hope you understand that everyone except Jesus Christ is a natural-born sinner. We come into this world crying, and most of us leave it crying, okay? We come into this world with either the nature of sin or the original sin, your choice, either way, we're going to sin. All of us. Which means no one is righteous. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Which means no one is righteous. I don't care how moral you are. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many people you help. I don't care how many times you don't use the Lord's name in vain. I don't care about any of that. All your righteousness without Christ is like filthy rags, Isaiah 61. It's of no value to God at all. It's human. It's a human thing. We like people that are moral. We, we make statues of people that are moral and do good things. God doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't care. Because he's righteous. He's perfect and he's holy. And the only thing that he respects is that. And the only way you can have that is through accepting his son as your savior. No one is uh, uh, moral or righteous. Romans 3, 10, and 11. It says, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There's none who seek after God. Listen, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they, what does the Bible say they did? They went and hid. They hid in the, in the forest, in the trees. God had to go looking for them. The same was true today. Every single lost sinner is hiding from God. They don't want him. They reject him. But he comes looking for you. He'll put a calling on your life. And to be clear, just so you know this, the same book of Romans in 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And that death means separation from God, but it also uh, means judgment day death, as in Revelation 20, 13 through 15. Read that, that section, Revelation 20, 13 through 15, and that explains what happens to people who don't trust Christ for their salvation. And I dare say, as a warning, the last human words you will ever hear, or the last words you'll ever hear if you die in your sin, are found in Matthew 25, 41. Jesus says, says, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. That's the bad news. I tell you why I preach about hell and fire, because Christ spoke more about that than he did about heaven. And it's important that, that people listening understand that if you haven't yet met Christ as your Savior, that you should know that. But that's the bad news. The good news is Romans 6, 23. Again, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. When our Savior cried out, it is finished, when he did that, it signaled that his death would atone for all his people's sins, for your sins. Everybody that comes to him and accepts him as, and let me tell you what accepting Christ as your Savior is. It's very, you know, people make this up, well, you got to have a prayer, you got to do that. No. If you want Christ to be your Savior, you know it. And you know how you know it? Because you want to know more about him. The things of God will matter to you. 
You'll want to learn more about him. You'll want to know more about his word. You'll want to know how you can apply his word to your life. And he says that. He says um, in Romans 10, 9, Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. Now a lot of people take that and say, well, okay, I believe in Christ, the historical Christ. I believe in all that stuff. And believe with your heart. Now there's where the rubber hits the road. If you confess Christ as your Savior and you want him to save you from your sins, what you have to do is you have to live your life like you believe that he's your Savior. And the way you live your life, the way uh, you believe he's a, your Savior, is you live between the guidelines of this book. And actually, most people that are lost do anyway. Live by the guidelines of this book. Make the things of God the main event in your life instead of a side event. Don't get hooked on ceremonialism. Don't get hooked on, 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 on people telling you all these wonderful things. Get hooked on God, period. I want to tell you something, all the blessings that's in this book, that's not the main blessing. God is the main blessing. He's the blessing, not, not the promises. They come with him. They are the accents, as the Beneful Dog commercial does. This dog's eating his food, and all of a sudden, these little carrots and peas come floating down. He says, oh, great, the accents. The blessings in the Bible are accents. God is the blessing that every, that every saint should look for. Nobody else. God. All those blessings come with it. If you love God enough to follow his commandments, then you love him. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. And that's exactly what it means to confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. That I love you enough that I'm going to set my will over here. I'm going to take your will and I'm going to live my life according to your will by that book. And I know I'm not going to be perfect at it. I know I'm going to fail at it occasionally, but I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best every day. That's what it means. You measure your life every day by his word. Paul gives us an example in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Simply means this, he was living for Christ. There's a hymn, living for Jesus. If you're not living for Christ, but after what I just said, if you feel your heart stirring you, if you want to know what it's like to be saved, you call me or see me. And I'll show you in his word how he wants to use the words, it is finished, to change your life in ways I don't think you'll ever be able to imagine. I've been in, saved for 23, 24 years, and I still can't imagine all that he's done and what he's going to do. Now, for God's people, Christ's life and death has always been of great interest to us, hasn't it? Why? Other than he's God because of, its, of his spiritual uniqueness and the eternal consequences that come from knowing Christ. For example, I'd have you note that Christ's death was not a natural death. It was a real death. It was the physical ending of life as we know it. When the guards went back because the Jews wanted uh, the, the, the condemned to die before the Passover, they broke all the legs except the Lord's. What did they do instead? They stuck him with a spear. They knew he was dead. He was dead, lifeless. Not one of those, uh, I died and came back. In that sense, he was dead, physically dead. He was crucified, and although he gave up the spirit, he was literally dead, his body was lifeless. And since Jesus was both God and man, it was his divine, eternal blood that stained that tree at Calvary. It wasn't just a regular man who died. It was God incarnate. Luke testifies to that in Acts 20, 28. He wrote, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath a, a purchased with his own blood. Now the question begs to be asked, how could the God-man possibly die? How could he die? Last week, if you were here or you listened, we had in John 1, uh, 1, 4, 1 and one fourteen, we had the answer. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became incarnate. He was one of us. He was born from a woman. He felt everything that we felt, including death. He tasted death. And the reality of his death was even more apparent 
when he was taken from the cross and what? They laid him in a borrowed tomb. His death was more apparent. But at the same time, as it was natural, it was also unnatural. Why was it an unnatural? By that I mean it was abnormal. Although the God-man could die because he was flesh, he could suffer deaths, the fact is death had no claim on Jesus Christ. No claim whatsoever. Romans 6.23 teaches us the wages of sin is death. I mentioned that a, a moment ago. But since Christ was sinless, death really had no legal claim to take hold on him at all. He was sinless throughout his life. Before his birth, the angel Gabriel told his mother Mary, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God, Luke 135. And not only was Jesus uh, born without sin, he lived his entire life without committing one sin. Not one sin. Think about that. You think you got a tough life? Try living sinless in this world. Try obeying the traffic laws perfectly for one day. I use that example because it's, imp it's impossible to me to do that as the other. Never, he never sinned. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, he did no sin. 1 John 3.5, he had no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he knew no sin. 1 Peter 1.19, he was without blemish and without spot. Even Pontius Pilate acknowledged that he could find no fault in him. All of which means that Christ was born sinless, he lived a sinless life, so death had no legal claim on him at all. It didn't. That's why his death was unnatural. He never in his life, from the time he was born to the time he said it is finished and gave up the ghost, never did he offend God one time. Think about that. Hebrews 4.15 teaches us that truth. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's why when we celebrate, we're coming up to Easter next week, I wanted to talk to you about the crucifixion and those three words, because they mean everything. Without sin, he lived for 33 years. I would also have you note that Christ's death was, listen to the term, preternatural. That is, it was planned out in advance, determined in eternity past. Revelation 13, 8. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before, uh, which means that when Adam, uh, when Adam was created, he already, the fall was already anticipated by God. Before sin entered the world, salvation for mankind was already planned out. Proof first. I love this verse, Ephesians 3, 11. This was according to the eternal purpose of, God's eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, in eternity past, the Godhead was perfect. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost was perfect in every respect. They had no needs at all for anything. They were perfect. And then they decided. They had a conference and they decided. They were going to make man in their image and make him the object of, the, of, of their love. Now if that doesn't make you melt. To think about, you were always in the eternal mind of God. And Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And you know what's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong. Not with that, but with us. Here's what's wrong with us. We don't handle love very well. You ever notice that? You know, we love so conditionally most of our life that what ends up happening is, oh, I love you today because this is going well. I, you know, I got a raise at work or this happened. I'm just happy. I want to click my heels, okay? And then tomorrow... When your alarm clock doesn't go off and you're going to go to work and the boss is going to give you a kick, okay? Oh, man, it's like, what? it was your fault the alarm clock didn't go off. Well, I'll tell you something, okay? Conditional love is what we grew up with, and we are now in a state of unconditional love. The Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in, the, in our hearts, and that simply means that we have the ability to love unconditionally. We should love God unconditionally, so no matter what he brings in our life, I don't care how bitter it is, love them even more because it's an opportunity to grow. When I love you as brothers and sisters, I love you like I love God unconditionally. When I love my enemies, I love my enemies, which is a G26 in the original Greek language, and it means with respect. 
before if you were my enemy, you don't want to even be on the same side of the street with me, okay? But now, if you're my enemy, it's okay. Because I'm a light for you. I know that if that light doesn't shine in your eyes and take those scales off, I know where you're going. I do. And I believe that with all my heart. So I'm going to give you the respect that you need so that maybe you can see something in my life that God might use to take your life and, 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 and change you and adopt you. There's somebody in this, sitting in this audience right now that that's happened to. He was a, a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And since uh, man sinned against an eternal holy God, since our sins against God are eternal because he's an eternal being, then the sacrifice for sin has to be spotless because he's holy, he's eternal. The blood has to be eternal and the sacrifice has to be holy. And nobody fits that qualifications except Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your uh, aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's why I said before, all your, all your moral stuff, all moral stuff that, that we do, as, as good as it is, in God's eyes, means nothing. It's worthless. It's less than worthless. You know why? Because it's insultive that you would offer God something that was moral instead of something that was holy. It's worthless because you would offer God anything that isn't eternal. You can't even, you can't even uh, uh, ask him to forgive you if you're, if you're without Christ. You can ask him to forgive you now, but how long does that last? Oh, till you go. <laughs> Once you're gone, that, that, that promise is gone. But that blood of Christ, that blood of Christ washed each and every one of you that are saved today. It washed you 2,000 years later. That's how, that's how efficacious or that's how powerful that blood is. That it can, and it'll do the job for another 2,000 years if the Lord tarries. It will. And lastly, Christ's death was supernatural. By that I mean his death was different from any other human death. Colossians 1.18 reminds us Jesus is preeminent in everything. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Which means... How about his birth? Virgin birth. Nobody did that. His life was different from all other lives. 2 Timothy 1.10. And his death was different from all other deaths. In, uh, I forget the, 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 the book, but it's in chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. It says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up. His entire life was different. His death was different. And we should also note that Christ's supernatural death triggered three supernatural events. It's recorded. First of all, the temple curtain was torn in two. Tombs were opened. People walked out of the grave. And the earth shook and rocks were split. You'll find that in Matthew 27, 51 and 52. First, the curtain in the temple was torn from, in two from top to bottom. That was a signal that the Old Testament sacrificial system was done and Christ sacrificed one time for all times had taken place. Now that curtain, according to historians, was three feet thick because it separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple because that's where God lived. Now imagine trying to rip a three foot thick curtain. It took supernatural strength to do that and only God could do it. And it, and it did signify no more temple worship Access to, the, to God has been opened up through the broken body of his son. John 14, 6. If you don't have this outlined, you should. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You can't get to God without Christ. I, I can't bring you there. The church can't bring you there. A priest can't bring you there. Your money can't bring you there. Your health, your goodness can't bring you there. Nothing except Jesus Christ, period. So important to understand Especially at Easter, 
It's about him and about what he did. The supernatural thing, all the supernatural things that he did. Someone has written, the, uh, talking about the earthquake and the broken rocks, the entire earth was shaken to its very foundation and rocked on its axis as though to show it was horrified at the most awful deed that had ever been perpetrated on its surface. Was there any, surf, any deed ever perpetrated by man on this surface that was grosser than crucifying the Son of God? Nope. And nature herself gave way as the rocks cracked and crumbled before the supernatural power that came from his death. And lastly, when Jesus died, Matthew testified, the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. That's God's word there. Matthew was inspired by God, and he said that the tombs were open and many bodies, those that were raised from the dead, you know what they were? They were living memorials to Christ's victory over sin and death. And I'm going to give you another thought. The next time you go near a cemetery and you look at all the tombstones, you know what they are? They're a memorial to sin because there was no sin before it came and affected man. All these supernatural events, all of them, were a witness to the supernatural character of our Lord Jesus Christ in his death. With the words that is finished, the great eternal purpose of God for the history of man was accomplished. He did it. All that the Redeemer came to do was fulfilled. And when Christ saw that all was accomplished in the cross, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's the story of the cross. The love of God for his elect people was fully demonstrated in that cross. There's no greater symbol of love than that cross. Occasionally, uh, I give my wife flowers, and when I do that, ah, she thinks that's so wonderful, right? And you know what I tell her? Because I think of this cross, I tell her, it's a symbol of my love. You see how that red rose and that yellow rose and all those other beautiful flowers, you see how they make you smile? You see how they fill you with joy? That's what the cross does for me. And that's what I want to do for you. That's loving somebody. In closing, I leave you with John 11, 25, and 26. And I leave you with that verse for a specific reason. Because in my view, it sums up, it's, it's the summary of just how these, these simple words, it is finished, how it changed the world. Listen to what he wrote, or what, what he said. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. I want you to take that home and think about our message this morning and the words, the three simple meat and potatoes words. It is finished. And then next week, we'll talk about the glorious resurrection. Let's pray. Father, we, I think sometimes we, we stumble like, like blind people at trying to understand the greatness of God. We can never do that. Your magnificence and your awesomeness is, is more than, than the human mind can, can, even, can even consider. But what we do know, Lord, is that that cross and the words, it is finished, are the greatest love symbols this world has ever seen or known. God, would you help us each and every day to remember all that was done so that those words, it is finished, could come out of, the, out of your son's mouth and in the process lead to salvation to your chosen people. Would you help us to, to, just in this new year, would you help us to remember that every day? And if there is one Lord who you're pressing into their heart to know Christ as Savior, would you give them, Lord, would you give them the, uh, the unction to call, to call upon me, Lord, or to see me, and let me show them in your word how it is finished will change their lives 
in ways they can't even imagine. We know it's your, uh, it's your will, so we ask all this with great faith, and most of all, always, for your glory and in Christ's name. Amen. <sighs> Closing hymn, Blue Hymnal, of course, Victory in Jesus, 370. Blue Hymnal, 370.